Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I'm Eki Tepsipornshai. Well, brother, it's good to be able to continue our, uh, what I think originally was just going to be a one podcast on I know question about Romans, uh, chapter 12 and verse three or four, I think it was. And now it's just kind of turned into a four part series. So today we're going to finish that uh, series. And I, I've titled the whole series, Renewing the Mind, uh, part one through four. And of course, there's a lot more than that but uh renewing the mind is sort of where we started this whole thing um last episode uh if you haven't heard um i'd encourage you to start at the very first one um and then kind of make your way through so that everything uh kind of works together and makes sense but we're going to pick up um uh, from verse 14 through the rest of the chapter during this uh, this episode so let me go ahead and just read that to us um, and then Eki will unload all of his wisdom <laughs> on, onto us for, for this episode. This will be a so, short episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't shortchange yourself, brother. You have lots of wisdom. You may not have lots of hair, but you have lots of wisdom. No, I don't. Yeah, I got more than you, though. Yeah, this is true. Uh, mine's <laughs> just on the other side of my face. so I'm. That's true. Yeah. You You have more on the bottom than I do at the top, I think. Yeah, well, that might be true. And it's... Uh, I look. Living in Alaska, it's sort of encouragement to just let it grow out, you know. So it's my winter coat. But uh, anyway, all right, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil. For evil to anyone, respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I mean, this is a jam back section. Yeah. And I, I think as I'm reading through this, what a word for the church for the environment in which we live today. Um, almost everything we've just read in this section of Romans 12 is counterintuitive to what our current society promotes and uh, pushes us to. And um, yeah. Uh, so let's just kind of jump in and go through this sort of a, a running commentary, as it were. Um, you know, we talked about, I think, bless those who persecute you last week, actually. Bless and do not curse. Um, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I wonder how much of this we really um, we re really endeavor to practice today. You know, do we really... Re yeah. rejoice with those who are rejoicing do we really weep with those who weep and the reason i ask that and i'd love to hear your view on this Eki, but i think our culture currently sort of tends to make us hard-hearted i mean this is the human mm -hmm. condition right sin and exposure to sin even battling against sin tends to make us hard-hearted right so that um just as a sort of a self-protection mechanism um but i think it'd be really good just to sort of consider what this looks like and where um, where Christ likeness is in in the midst of rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. I, I mean, what are your thoughts about about that? Yeah, you know, this entire last section, a lot of it is geared towards uh, the outside world, but not all of it. And you kind of have to evaluate each uh, verse on its own. It almost starts to feel a little bit like Proverbs, the way um, Paul is kind of throwing out these uh, these statements. And we did talk about bless those who persecute you, um, bless and do not curse. And we mentioned last week about how we want to desire that they um, that they know the gospel, they come to know the Lord. And then verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Um, this is something to be applied internally within the body of Christ. 
Um, Because we don't simply just rejoice over what the world rejoices over, because we know the world rejoices over a lot of ungodly things, and they weep over things that they really shouldn't be weeping over. Um, this is talking about within the body of Christ. This is one of those. Uh, this is one of those one another's, um, and this is how we um, become unified with the body of Christ. Uh, when someone, when when someone enjoys a certain blessing in their life, uh, they they have an answer to prayer. We want to be able to rejoice with them. We want to be able to praise God. This shows us to be others oriented. And I've mentioned before, and I'll mention it again, John. 1335, Jesus said, they will know you're, you are my disciples by your love for one another. But rejoicing with those who rejoice is easier than the weeping with those who weep. Um, now, rejoicing with those who rejoice could be difficult if, for instance, you're not seeing a blessing in your life that someone else sees, right? Um, that can turn into envy. That can turn into, uh, well, why did why were you blessed in this way and I wasn't blessed? It could be, for instance, health issues. Uh, maybe you're dealing with health issues that someone else is not, or maybe someone else has gotten out of a, a season of suffering and, and now they've they've received some good news or they're feeling much stronger, um, but you're not. You know, are, are you still able to rejoice with them uh, as opposed to just comparing your situation with them? But then weeping with those who weep, um, th- this takes th- this really takes sacrifice. All right, because people in their nature don't want to hear others who are mourning and weeping. In fact, in our culture, we're very much um, optimism. You know, people say be positive. Um, you know, try to find people who are positive who are going to build you up. And in fact, when you think about the Joel Olstein brand of Christianity and the prosperity brand of Christianity, it's all about positive thinking and just trying to build one another up. But to weep with someone who is weeping is really to be there with that person and, and mourn with them. And then I think of the book of Job, and I know you love the book of Job. When it comes to Job's friends, they initially respond the right way. You know, as they came around Job, they remained silent and just wept with him. And sometimes when people are going through difficult times, you know, that might not be the exact time to break out Romans 8.28 and say, well, God causes all things to come together for good. That certainly is true, but in that point in time, you want to be able to just mourn with them. Um, and Ecclesiastes uh, says there is a time for mourning, and it, and so we want to recognize that. And I think within the body of Christ, just being there for someone really helps to build bonds, and it allows you to help bear the burden that other people are bearing. Um, it's a lot easier to go through difficulties and to deal with burdens when other people are bearing it with you then to feel like you're left alone on an island. So really the love of Christ, I think, is often most exemplified when people go through difficult times and seeing how much um, they're willing to uh, to, to, to weep and, and help bear each other's burdens during those times. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, when we talk about this, we're, we're thinking of characteristics like compassion, and empathy, yeah. and sympathy. Um, and, and you're right. It's interesting because something that seems so simple is really a very um, selfless act because you have to put your own thoughts and opinions and feelings aside um, just to to join in and be there with this other person. And yeah, our culture doesn't really do that too well. Um, and, it, you know, outside of the body of Christ, it obviously, you know, you don't see much of this. In fact, I mean, just I think an illustration as I'm thinking about it is, you know, how many videos are out there on social media of someone being attacked or something horrendous, right. uh, hor- horrendous right. happening to someone, and all you see are people video recording it. N- yeah. No one's helping. Right. No one's, I mean, that's that's kind of just indicative of the very opposite mentality of this. Um, and, and so as believers, you know, we have to guard our hearts against kind of that same mentality of callousness towards uh, brothers and sisters who are suffering for whatever reason, right? Um, yeah, and so I, th- I think there's some conscious effort on, on our part. Uh, it, it's easy to rejoice, as you say, with people. Um, sometimes, al- although I'm just thinking while you were talking about the rejoicing even, um, it, you know, Satan's very crafty, and just about every command of Scripture, every characteristic of um, a godly person, uh, Satan will try to twist and manipulate somehow and in some way. Yeah. Everything that reflects the person and work and nature and character of Christ, Satan wants to twist and manipulate and turn it into something ugly. 
Uh, and these things are no exception. And so even rejoicing with someone's rejoicing, um, it, there's a whole wave um, of ideology in society that is is absolutely a- antithetical to this. And it says something like this, rather than rejoice because you have something I don't, I, I'm I'm going to be offended because I deserve no. that too. Right? right. I mean, that's the mentality. And we see that all over in uh, outside of the church. And so, um, yeah. And so I think we have to guard our hearts from, as you say, envy and, and jealousy and things like that. Um, you know, and let me, gives... let me, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go on. Finish that thought. Yeah. No, no. I'd... Go for it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, when you know someone within the body of Christ is going through difficulties, um, sometimes it's a lot easier just to say, I'll pray for you and then, you know, let it be at that and and not think about it uh, really through the week or just kind of throw them into um, a prayer. But, you know, a, a lot of times there's great benefit in just calling that person sometime during the week and letting that person know that, hey, I'm praying for you or even taking a moment to pray with that person over the phone or even sending a text message or an email with a prayer actually typed out. Um, that uh, that they can read and, and be blessed by. But it just goes to show that when someone is suffering, that you're not just going about on your merry way, but you're actually thinking about those people. Um, and this is this is all what it means to be uh, in Christ, what, what it means to, to be as a, a part of one body. And it makes the body stronger. And it really forces us to be others oriented, to think of other people, which is You know, when you look at Philippians 2, for instance, the great passage on the humility of Christ about how he emptied himself and became, um, became, took on, took on flesh, became uh, uh, in the, um, in the likeness of a slave, and he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. But leading up to that, Paul is trying to encourage the people in Philippi to consider others as being even more important than themselves. And, and so this is just where the body of Christ works together. And, and they are truly one. It doesn't mean that you have to be miserable in your life. And in fact, I would argue that when you're there for other people, you're going to feel um, you're going to feel the blessings of the Holy Spirit of of being connected to the body, and uh, and and also not only that, but the person that you're helping is going to greatly appreciate it. They're going to greatly remember it, and and you know what? They're also going to be more encouraged to do the same. When, uh, when the shoe is on the other foot or when other people go through the same thing. Now, we don't do this simply so that we can be blessed. We do this because this is what it means to be like Christ. But it's amazing how everything just works better together when we are when we have that others-oriented kind of mindset. Yeah, well, I think there's a general principle that in heartfelt obedience, there's always blessing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I say heartfelt because, right, you could do something legalistically uh, in, in to earn God's favor or blessing. Um, and you certainly won't get it that way, you know? So you, you can feed the hungry all you want. Uh, if, if you're just doing it because you want God to bless you, um, that's not going to have the same result in your person as, um, if you have opportunity to feed the hungry and you're doing it because you're, you're genuinely concerned, uh, for their well being, And so, yeah, good, good thoughts. Um, mo- moving on, this next one is interesting. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind. There's a word for the day, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. I mean, what's Paul talking about here? I mean, what does it mean to be of the same mind uh, towards one another? I think we understand the next phrase, but then he says, "Be uh, uh, but associate with the lowly." What, what's he? Yeah. What's he meaning here? Yeah, you know, I, I think of um, Philippians one twenty seven. Let me read that real quick. Uh, Paul says this: "Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel." So the being of the same mind first um, emphasizes unity. Um, it, it's being of the same mind, but being in the same mind in the way that Christ wants us to be. Um, in terms of um, being humble, um, having his desire, his purposes, but to be of the same mind towards one another, I, I see this as just an encouragement of love, right? Uh, we we are called to love one another within, well, we're called to love our neighbor, that's for sure. But just as Jesus, again, John 13, 35, they shall know you are my disciples by your love for one another. So be of the same mind towards one another, and you can't separate that love uh, from 
humility. Um, it, they they come together, which is why the very next part of that says, "Do not be in mind, but associate with the lowly." And so we recognize that within the body of Christ, uh, we we should not be partial. Now it's understandable that there are going to be certain people that um, we develop closer relationships with others. It, that's not a sin, um, but we also want to reach out to those who maybe um, you know maybe they're. And I think I see this going back to weeping with those who weep. The lowly could be those who are struggling; um, they're they're having difficulty, or maybe those that are just not as well regarded uh, within the body of Christ, or, or maybe they're not as well known. You know, just like when Paul talks about the spiritual gifts and how we're all members of the same body, there's no such thing as one person with a better gift than the other. You know, they're they're all needed. And so to associate with the lowly, not to be haughty in mind, it, this is an encouragement towards humility. And so to be of the same mind with one another is what is a characteristic of love, the love that Jesus Christ showed towards us, obviously, by going to the cross and the love that he encourages to us. And this is actually, this is exactly how we show the world that we are truly disciples of, our, of Christ by our love for one another. And it, 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 let me just remind people this, and we've heard this before, but it's, it's worth repeating. If you simply just love people who are lovable, you're no different than the world, mm. right? To, to, to love people who love you, to love people who give to you or support you, well, that makes you no different than the world. It's to love the ones that don't give, the ones that maybe can't give, the ones who maybe are a little bit more difficult to get along with. Um, that That's when you truly show the, the, the love of Christ. And when all people are of the same mind towards one another in this way, it, it shows it shows that there is a supernatural force at work, which is the Holy Spirit. And there's a supernatural love that can only be realized through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. You, you know, I was thinking of an example um, that uh, many years ago, um, I was working part-time for the sheriff's office uh, as a dedicated law enforcement 911 operator. So didn't do any emergency service stuff. It was just all law enforcement. And it was interesting because I remember one of the calls. In fact, I'll never forget that 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 911 call. Um on a, a lady on Sunday morning um was uh, called in and so this is during like a training time. So um at the beginning of my term there, but uh, so I was working a Sunday morning and doing church in Sunday evening. This lady called on Sunday morning, and what she wanted that was the emergency was that there was a homeless person that had come to church, and he was sitting in the back pew, and he smelled bad. I, I, I'm, I'm not mm. exaggerating or making this up. She called 911 as a member of wow. that church um, and wanted the sheriff's office to come and remove this man because he smelled bad and wow. thus was, quote, interrupting the service. Yeah. And I, I mean, that was heartbreaking because, you know, my my lots of simultaneous thoughts going through my mind. But um, one is what in the world are you doing calling 911 for something like this? But two, and more importantly, how are you a member of a church, a professing Christian trying to get, you know, law enforcement to remove a homeless person yeah, uh, because right. they smell bad? And and I think that's the perfect example of um of of the opposite of this passage, right? That was not being of the same mind towards mm. someone else. Now, I don't know if he professed to be a Christian or not. Yeah, uh, right, right. In all likelihood, probably not. But the the idea that he was somehow not um, worthy or just too downcast um, to even be in the presence of this lady because you know he hadn't had a bath for a while or whatever. Yeah. And so the word of God, him hearing the word of God wasn't important to this lady. Him being treated as, I mean, even just with the dignity of of being in, made in the image of God wasn't right, even there. Right. So that's an extreme example. And I only ever had a call like that once. Uh, and that was a long, long time ago now. But I will never forget that. It, it's just such yeah. a good example of how you can go to church every Sunday and just be totally and utterly worldly and devoid yeah. the, the character and nature of Christ, right? Um, but that's what this is talking about. We don't have any partiality. I mean, this is another thing, right, that has crept into the church. Um, I mean, just to be very blunt, this whole idea of there being a black Christianity and a white Christianity, and yeah. you bring yeah. something to Christianity because you're, you know, you have more or less melanin than I do. 
that I mean, that is utterly evil um, because it makes a distinction where God clearly does not make a distinction. In fact, commands us not to. And so if you are a Christian who happens to be black or a Christian who happens to be Asian or a Christian who happens to be Irish, um, you're all just Christian and we should look at each other in, in the same way. And I think, you know, this extends to the rich and the poor. I mean, we see this in scripture too, not to give one preference uh, over another. And so, you know, in our day and age, I, I think it's not, we don't have the same challenges in these. And so when we read through these passages, I think it behooves us to ask the question, how are these challenges in our cultural context, right? Um, it, you know, for a long time, we weren't thinking about black and white Christianity, and that's just kind of resurfaced over the last few years with the whole social justice movement and things like that. But now that's something to be conscious of. Are we looking at brothers and sisters because of their skin color and treating them differently, yeah. either yeah. elevating them in the way we treat them or mm. looking down on them? Both ways are sinful. That's part the sin of partiality, right? Um, and so, yeah. And so those are good things to think about. Um, verse 17, never pay evil, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. You know, this first sentence, I, I think this is a big one. And we probably cross this line way more than we realize. Um, because I, I think we often go to the worst case scenario, right? Well, I, I haven't repaid back evil. You know, I haven't sued this person or I haven't, you know, drugged them to the courts or whatever. But that's not always necessarily the way we repay people back. It could just be that um, someone's gossiped about us and we gossip yeah. back, right? Mm -hmm. um, it could just be that we hold a grudge in unforgiveness. I mean, that's a form of, of, of paying someone back in an evil way, right? Rather than forgiving them, we're holding on to a grudge. Um, what are some of your thoughts on that passage? What are some of the ways yeah. you, you think the church needs to be thinking about this in particular? Yeah, and and I think this um, th this partially ties back to the end of verse sixteen. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Um, in verse sixteen, obviously, Paul is encouraging humility, um, discouraging pride, and so that thought is there. Do not be wise in your own estimation. But I think that then ties into never pay back evil for evil. Um, don't think you know more than God. Don't think that you're wiser than God. Don't don't think you need to take uh, matters in, into your own hand. And and I think of uh, what, what comes to mind is First uh, Peter two. Uh, in First Peter chapter two, um, Peter starts off with uh, therefore putting aside all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. And the setting for First Peter, Peter is writing to believers outside of Rome who are concerned about the persecution that has started in Rome when Nero was starting to execute Christians for a fire that they did not set, and so they're worried about that making its way out. And it's dip it's typically during these times of evil against good that we start to justify things like malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander like there there's there there's a righteous time to slander there's a righteous time to be a hypocrite or to be envious or to be deceitful and and whatnot um but that should never be the case with us that that should never be what characterizes us at all so never pay back evil for evil you know th this is uh we stop we, we stop remembering that this is not our home Right, Philippians three twenty says our citizenship yeah. is in heaven. Okay, it's not here and now. Um, this world we're going to be hated. In this world we're going to be um, persecuted. Jesus warned us that in John fifteen verses eighteen and twenty specifically. Um, so never pay back evil uh, for evil to to anyone. Um, you don't you don't justify. Um, you don't justify evil because you're responding to someone else's evil. Basically, the uh, the uh, the values that we have in Scripture, the principles that we are to live by, are principles that um, are are to always be exhibited through us, and to respect what is right in the sight of all men. You know, there there's common grace um, that everyone um, everyone receives. You know, we know that everyone's been given a conscience. Um, everywhere you go, there are common laws that you see just about everywhere that uh, that is meant to protect um, innocent lives, meant to protect people's property, things like that. 
Um, and, and so we we recognize that within society, and and this is where that end of seventeen um, ties into what we see in verse eighteen as well. Um, respect what is good and right um, in, in society, and because if you pay back evil for evil, now you look no better than the evil that you're trying to pay back. Um, people can't distinguish you from from the world. So verses seventeen and then going into eighteen and nineteen, I, I believe they they all tie very closely together. And, and this has to do with living by our principles, but also living as an example to the world. And when we get into verse 18, if possible, so far it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now, biblically speaking, that word peace, um, we first should think about the peace that we have with God, because previously we were enemies of God, we were rebelling against mm -hmm. God, and to have peace with God means that between us and God, there is no longer um, any animosity, um, that uh, that our sins have been paid for, that the wrath has been satisfied, and now we don't have to um, worry about the, the consequences of being at enmity, at enmity with God. So what does it mean to be at peace with all men? Well, it means that we're not warring and we're, we're, we're not striving against them. We're not we're not creating um, unnecessary conflicts conflicts with them. Um, this doesn't mean we compromise the truth. It does, this doesn't mean we bend over backwards for whatever they want us to do. But certainly we don't do anything um, that would suggest we're, we're instigating trouble or we're trying to provoke uh, something that uh, that would be counter, counter to peace. Uh, so as much as possible so far, it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. This ties back to respecting what is right in the sight of all men, and this ties back to never paying evil for evil and not being wise in your own estimation. Yeah, in other words, we're not to be contentious, right? Brawlers, right. quick to fight. I th this is an interesting one because I I think you know we see this a lot in in, in the church, and I think um, politics might be a great example here. Uh, we just use politics as an example um, vaguely and kind of generally. So. I think almost everyone hates it when we see, um, for instance, you, you'll see these slander campaigns, right, uh, or whatever you call them, um, against a politician. And then, and then the last thing anyone wants to see is the the, the politician who is directed at respond in kind, right, and and go on a similar uh, campaign against, like you know, every time a politician ignores the slander. Um, or the accusations and just campaigns purely yeah, on what he right. believes, what he's trying to get done. Almost everyone is like, wow, that guy's taking the high road, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and regardless of what side it's coming from, I mean, normally it's the left to the right, but that's not always true. There have been often times where I was really disappointed in conservative politicians because yeah. they were doing exactly the same thing. Right. Um, and, and And that's this kind of mentality. And I think the way it creeps into the church looks quite a bit differently. And oftentimes, I, I think in our current context, and this is just my perception, so maybe you have a different one, Nikki, but it seems like um, the, we kind of have the propensity to attack the world in, in the same way they're attacking us. And yeah. so we sort of right. make enemies of the various groups out there. So the government attacks the church, and now all of a sudden the government is, quote unquote, the enemy. And so we need to attack them. We need to maneuver uh, and try to make things happen. The LGBTQ group attacks the church, yep, and so now yep. they're vile and they're all these things. And, you know, I'm quite happy to talk about how the the, the transgender movement that's really and truly targeting children is um, yeah. basically pedophilic in nature. I mean, these are targeting yeah. children for sexual perversion. We can say those things that are true without right. making them um, to be an enemy um, yeah. other than just where they are. Um, I can I can do two things at once. I can say that uh, we need to guard our children against that movement and at the same time desperately long to see their salvation, to want to preach the gospel um, rather than just engage in the same kind of hateful rhetoric um, th that they're aiming towards the church. So I think that's one way we see this playing out in the church is we have the tendency to lash back out in a way that doesn't demonstrate our righteousness in Christ. I mean, if you look at Christ, and there's no greater example, um, and you can look at the apostles, we never see them lashing back 
at the people who are persecuting them. Right. Um, and I think sometimes I, either we've forgotten what Rome was like, right? When yeah. we're reading these epistles and we're hearing Paul say things like, never pay back evil for I- evil. I, I just, we need to remember that the conditions of Rome, when Paul penned this, was so far worse than what we have in our country. It's almost beyond imagining. Um, yeah. If you just do a cursory uh, historical study of what Nero was like as an emperor and what some of mm-hmm. these other guys were like and what Christians were enduring, I yeah. think it helps put into perspective some of what Paul's saying, right? I mean, he's saying not to repay evil for evil, and the Romans are torturing Christians. Yeah. Uh, we 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 don't even like that the government's trying to close, you know, shut the churches down during COVID. And I agree, that's not acceptable. Um, but the the response is quite different, I think, sometimes than the response we're supposed to give. So I I think the right response is. Sorry, government, we can't do that. Uh, we'd rather obey God than men, right, and we'll willingly right. accept whatever. Now, here, here's the catch: we'll willingly accept whatever punishment you 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 want to exercise. You know, yeah, I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Perfect example, right? Um, sorry, King, we cannot worship you. Uh, we can't do that. And then they willingly submitted to being executed. I mean, that mm-hmm. was the punishment. Right. Yeah. And by mm-hmm. the way, being executed in a I, I can't even fathom what it must have been like um to know you're about to be burned to death in a furnace, yeah, whatever that looks like. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yet they they willingly um submitted to that. That's something I don't think as Americans our culture has ever been very good at. Um yeah. and it and it creeps into the church, right? We can both defy ungodly edicts, and in our defiance, we have to willingly, uh, I I think, um, go along with the the penalty and trust God in the midst of that. I know guys have different views on that, but I just don't see any other response in Christ or the apostles. Now, the apostle Paul, for instance, um, some people will say, well, he fought back because he appealed to Caesar. Well, that wasn't fighting back. That it was the equivalent. Physically. Yeah. Right. That was maybe the equivalent of going to court. Yeah. Right. So the government shuts you down. Grace Community Church takes the government to court. Um, and they weren't combative. They weren't any of that. Right. And if they would have lost the case and had to pay the money, you know, at the end of the day, or if they would have been taken to jail, you know, I have no doubt that MacArthur would have willingly you know, went. I mean, he would have gone Mm -hmm. to prison. He wouldn't have fought anybody. He wouldn't have made a scene about it. Um, He jokes about how he would have just had a prison ministry, but exactly. um, Exactly. And, and and so I think those are kind of the things in our culture we should be thinking about Uh, when, when our culture attacks us, do we lash out in kind or do we respond graciously knowing that they don't deserve it, but knowing that we also didn't deserve that graciousness. Yeah, the, the letter that Peter wrote, the same one that I just quoted from, um, where the setting is Nero persecuting Christians for a fire that they did not start. Um, Peter goes on to say in chapter 3, verse 13, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? And then verse 14, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. So it's better to be able to suffer for the sake of doing what is good um, than to just simply return evil for evil. And you had brought up the LGBTQ community. I think that is a group. And certainly we have to remember what Paul said in Ephesians, that our battle is not um, is not f- is not flesh and blood. It's a- against the spiritual realm. And on the one hand, we know that the LGBTQ community is is a tool of Satan to try to silence Christians, to bring about ungodliness and immorality. And yet we also have to understand that the people who are involved in it need salvation. Right, um, it, we're we're not seeking harm against them. So this is how we live this out while still standing upon truth and recognizing the reality of the spiritual war. That a lot of what they're pushing is absolutely evil. And and though there are things that we believe as Christians 
that are very specific to being Christians. For instance, I don't expect an unbeliever to come and worship God in a worship service. I don't expect an unbeliever to be in his Bible every day, reading it and meditating upon it, right? But I, I also know that unbelievers recognize the evil uh, of pedophilia, right? Um, parents um, who are not Christians um, inherently know that there is something wrong with my child being taken advantage of by someone who's of uh, full adult age. And, and so to stand up uh, for those folks is in our way standing up for peace, right? We're we're seeking peace, but we're seeking peace for, for the right reasons. We're doing what is right in, in the eyes of, of even the world. Now, there are people that defend this kind of behavior, but those those types of people are are the ones that are, are caught in this evil and spiraling downwards in their thinking. They are detached from reality. They're becoming delusional. And, and the way that we handle that is not to give into their delusion, but it is to stand upon what is true and right and to do it peacefully, right? So we can we can stand against the LGBTQ agenda, knowing that the agenda is essentially a spiritual attack on what is true and very much a spiritual attack on what I would call common good, that even unchristians, people who are not Christians, would be able to recognize. And yet at the same time, we have to be careful about treating those within the LGBTQ movement as if the people themselves are enemies worthy of condemnation. Certainly, if they don't repent, they are, but that's true for everyone. And, and we want for them to know the gospel. We also want to pr protect their civil liberties, right? I, I don't want to endorse anyone that's seeking to harm them. Um, I, if someone claims to be a Christian and does harm against them because of their lifestyle, well, I'm going to defend them um, because that's not that's not the way Christians are to respond, and they don't deserve that kind of violent attack. But for people that speak out against it and say this is wrong, um, our children need to be protected. This is actually one way in which I believe we love our neighbor by protecting what is good and right in in the um, in the in the face in the eyes of all men who still have. Um, some common sense uh, in them from the conscience given to them by God. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I think of Paul in, uh, what is it, First Corinthians, where he gives a long list of, you know, he, he, neither adulterers or idolaters or those who are sexually yeah, immoral, right. uh, those who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, as such were some of you. Right. right. Uh, I think chapter six, maybe chapter six. Um, yeah. Verse nine and, and 10, I think. Yeah. And so the, the point is to remember that literally we were no better. Right. Than them. And I mean, that's an incredibly important thing. You talk about spiritual warfare. I mean, this is one of my contentions with some of the things we see today is we mm -hmm. uh, we really have, I think, as a church as a whole. And I know that's a strong statement, but I think the Western church has totally forgotten where our real battle is and because yeah. we've forgotten that we've forgotten what our real weapons are and you mentioned ephesians in ephesians chapter six let me just read uh the first couple verses when it gets into the armor of god verses 10 through uh, 12 or 13 here he says finally be strong in the lord and in the strength of his might put on the full armor of god why paul so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God yep. so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. And then, of course, he goes on to list the various pieces of armor. I mean, this is crucial. I, I think even to just Romans 12, where we're talking about not taking, you get into verse 19, he says, never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, um, yeah. not to repay evil for evil, because we understand where our real battle lies. And I like that you distinguish the LGBTQ uh, people from the agenda, right? right? I mean, that is a demonically empowered agenda and he's using unbelievers just like satan uses world govern governments um and so we're not talking about pacifism obviously uh right. you live the christian life you stand for truth you stand firm for truth but what we don't do is do it in a manner that's unholy and ungodly um contentious and combative and i yeah. think there's this whole 
um, kind of thing that's crept into the church that really says, if it's bad enough, it's then okay to malign. Right. It's then okay right. to slander. It's okay um, to make mocking memes about fellow Christians. It's okay uh, mm -hmm. to do these kinds of things. Uh, and really, it's just the very worldly mindset of uh, the means just the ends justify the means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just that that's just totally antithetical to Christian character and Christian nature. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point. So, it, you know, it, it's not the leaders of the government who we're opposed to. It, it's what they're promoting and what they're doing. Um, and the way to combat the LGBTQ agenda is obviously we use all the means that we have um, legally and peacefully. We can, you know, we, we can take legal actions. We can do all those things. But at the end of the day, it, if our war is against the spiritual efforts, then the solution is actually the gospel, right? Yeah. The the actual gospel. We we don't. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a very loosely used way. Calling people in the LGBTQ community, for instance, to repent, to turn from their sins, and to yeah. trust in Christ wholly and solely right. for their salvation. Um, and and that's how we overcome that agenda. And if you miss that, then you exert a whole lot of energy, maybe a lot of it ungodly. Um, and, and then the the solution isn't what it should be or what it could be. Right. Yeah, and move, so that's, move, um, yeah, moving on to verse 19. Uh, why don't you go ahead and read that? Yeah, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. repay, uh, repay. Yeah, and that, uh, and that leads into verse 20 as well. I would put those together. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heep burning coals on his head. Um, so whoever it is that stands um, against us, um, we are not to take vengeance. Now, um, I am not against using the legal system, right? Making use of the legal system to protect um, civil rights. So, I mean, if if someone comes and, and robs uh, the house of another or my house or takes some of my belongings then I, I would very much want the civil laws to be able to kick in place and to persecute, uh, prosecute anyone who is uh, is guilty of that. But and that's this a peaceful is to say way that, to do that. Yeah, exactly. It, it is a peaceful way to do that. And and as well, if you come and try to harm my wife, I'm going to stand and defend her, right? And I know you would do the yep. same. You know, Absolutely. if you come and try to harm the children of my church, I'm going to defend them. All right, so I, I'm, I'm not above... Um, I'm not one of these pacifists that say never resort to any kind of physical defense. I will yeah. um, if you're if you're breaking the law um, in order to um, in order to commit violence to someone. I will defend them. That's not an act of vengeance. That's an act of defense. That's a, there's a very big difference. So an yeah. act of um, vengeance might be if someone burns down the church, you're going to turn around and burn down their homes, right? You, you need to leave room for the uh, for for the wrath of for the wrath of God. And a great example of this is Jim Elliott and Elizabeth Elliott, mm -hmm. right? Jim Elliott, uh, he he gets uh, he gets killed by some of the um, some of the natives there while he's on he's on mission trying to share the gospel, and his wife, rather than bringing vengeance and saying, "Well, you killed my husband, I'm going to see to it that you die as well," no, she turns around and goes and and brings the gospel to them and continues the mission. So the way we respond to enemies who have done evil for us is exactly in verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. You see, when we do good to those who do evil, we leave them with no excuse for their evil, right? And and we also leave it in the hands of God, because first of all, they, they might repent. Um, God may use um, our actions, as well as the Holy Spirit, to convict their hearts, to bring them to repentance— or they may continue not to repent, and in that sense, what you're doing, um, it's what Paul says in Philippians 1, it's, it's really a sign of your salvation, but it's, it's a sign of their judgment, right? So they're actually heaping on further judgment upon themselves by continuing to uh, respond with evil when you continue to do good. So leave those who are evil um, with no excuse um, by being Christ-like in your behavior, even going above and beyond to love them, to to um, actually um, even look after their needs if you have those opportunities to do so. Um, but at the same time, just trusting God to either bring them to repentance or to bring about his judgment at the proper time. 
Yeah. And I think this is a hard one because this just goes against yeah. human nature, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I think when we're responding to whatever it is out there, um, you, you know, and, and it's always been, you know, Christians for the most part against the government. I mean, that's just been historically true, right? Look, mm -hmm. look at Israel, look at, you know, um, Christians all throughout history. You can look at the Jews, the, the same kind of thing. Um, and the question is, are we responding in a way that's good? Um, and this is hard, right? Because this person doesn't deserve that. Um, you know, they should be punished. It's it's wicked. And uh, to respond this way, I think, really requires um, a, a lifestyle of having developed uh, holiness and submission to Scripture. No one can do this in uh, unless they are a person of Scripture, um, you know, a person of prayer, a person who takes yeah. their faith seriously, because this is really hard. And I think we, we see that today, and we've I'm sure we've all crossed that line uh, at times. And uh, I like the distinction, right? We're not talking about uh, not defending your your children or your family. Um, absolutely, if, if someone breaks into my house, you know, in the middle of the night and, you know, my wife's here, they're just, they're just going to get shot. Um, and I have no remorse about that. So don't break into my yeah. house. Um, you know, that's quite a different thing. I think the, um, the, the action that's taken can't overweigh the threat, right? Yeah. And we should never resort to physical violence un unless it is biblically necessary to fulfill a duty that we have. Um, and that will almost always, I would argue, not even include ourselves necessarily, but it could, um, but protecting loved ones that we uh, are, are given to care for. Yeah. So right. we're not talking about pacifism, um, but it, this would be like, I, I think in the church today, Eki, this would mostly come down to how we respond in word and in written uh, messages, how we um you know, even just how we greet one another in in, in church, um, how we treat strangers that might come to church. A better one might be for us, I think, um, how do we respond to protesters that may come into the church, right? Yeah. I mean, this happens today. You get guys who come in, and sometimes they come in, and it's more of a quiet thing, um, but you know they're there to take notes and mock the church afterwards, um, maybe sometimes it's not as quiet and, you, you know, you can't, you can't have yeah. anyone interrupting the Lord's day service, but, um, right. how do we respond to those people in the parking lot or if they come into the church? I think that's where the rubber meets the road mostly. Um, and then yeah. of course, brothers and sisters in Christ, I mean, how we respond to each other, um, especially when it's out there for the world to see, I mean, how do we respond on Facebook and, you know, all the social media platforms, um, yeah, I, I think it's incredibly um, important to view those things. But I, I think this is the hardest part of, of this whole passage, right? You can go through and you can say rejoice with rejoice. Okay, check. Uh, weep with weak. Weep, weep, weep with those who are weeping. I need to do uh, some work in my life on that. But check. Um, never take revenge. Okay, well, I'm not going to burn anybody's house down, but maybe I just hold a grudge and never forget that person. No. That's actually the same thing, right? Um, you know, do good to those who are doing evil to me. That's a hard one. No. Probably the hardest one in this list, I think. Um, and sometimes it, it's interesting because all of these ultimately get down to heart issues. I mean, this is where, you know, I think of places where Jesus has said, you know, You've heard it said not to commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who's looked at a, lum, a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery, right? A lot of these things is don't be fooled that just because you don't physically lash out at someone, that that doesn't mean you aren't committing evil against them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the issue, I think, is for believers, I think like David, our heart posture needs to be when we sin— We've sinned firstly against the Lord, yep. right, and and then certainly towards uh, other other people, and that I think those are the things that we need to be uh, thinking about. And then, of course, the last verse: Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And he's just sort of reiterating 
um, giving us a last sort of summary of all these last things that he's just been saying and really pressing down the, the point that our response as believers to evil could be considered good in the sight of God. Not good in our own sight, but good in the sight of God. Um, yeah, there are just so many examples. You you referenced uh, the Elliot's End of the Spear, I think, is the name of the movie that yes. kind of is yep. based on their story. Man, if mm -hmm. you haven't seen that movie, go watch it. it. It's incredible. And I know there's you know theatrical liberties taken, but no. the heart of the story is is captured well in that. Yep. Um, read uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. You know, there are some silly people out there who don't like Pilgrim's Progress. Who, who knows why? But Pilgrim's Progress is such an incredible allegory yeah. of mm -hmm. what it's like to be heavenly minded, yeah. walking through this world as a sojourner, because this is not our kingdom. Our kingdom is yet to come. And how to respond to wickedness and evil um, in a godly manner. And I mean, I mean, Bunyan just depicts that so well, especially when you get to the chapter uh, of Vanity Fair. So if you haven't seen that movie, go see it. If you haven't read Pilgrim's Progress, go buy it today. Like, pause yeah, the video. Definitely. We're about to end. But as soon as it ends, go buy it and read it. It'll bless you. I mean, it's been an incredible book for me. I try to read it every year. And uh, every year I read it, I, I'm just struck by by different things and it encourages my own walk. But um, yeah, why don't you wrap yeah, this up? Eki, mm -hmm. Any final thoughts as we've yeah, kind of and, gone and through this chapter? Just, yeah, this is kind of a random thought. You, you mentioned End of the Spear, and, and that's definitely a good movie to see uh, about the story of uh, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. And kind of ironic, um, the actor that uh, played the role of uh, of Jim Elliot or um, or Jim Elliot's son, in fact, it may even be the same actor, but uh, the, the, the main actor of that movie is actually a homosexual. And there was a time where he was actually invited to speak um, on, it was either Larry King or one of these uh, news interviews, but side by side with John MacArthur. And they were talking about their kind of differences uh, about uh, the, the biblical view of homosexuality. And if you get a chance, just pull that up on YouTube mm -hmm. and watch the compassion that John MacArthur has when he's addressing this young actor. Um, he, he doesn't go and slam him, doesn't doesn't uh, you know doesn't rake him over the coals with with scripture, but just gently tries to share the truth. And and I think that's a just a great picture of recognizing that um, there are evil forces at work, but the people who are involved in it are caught in it and need the gospel. Um, so all, all that to, to say this this verse twenty one: Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think this is just a great principle statement uh, for all that uh, Paul has been trying to get across over these last several verses. And Paul himself is a great example. Um, he, he's been stoned. He's been left for dead. He's been he's been in prison. He's been beaten. He's been falsely tried. He's had all kinds of things uh, done to him, and yet we don't see a single example of him responding back with physical violence. I mean, he must have been a pretty sturdy man to go through all that he went through, but he never responded back in that way. And it's um, the, the irony is also not lost on me that who is he writing to here? He's writing to the believers in Rome. And then when Christians are being persecuted, who is it that's responding to that persecution by telling believers to do what is good? That's Peter. Um, and Peter himself was was a very strong man as well. I just got through preaching. Uh, well, I'm at the end of the book of John. And when they caught 153 fish in the last chapter, Peter brought, the, brought that net onto shore. I mean, he was a strong guy. And here he is telling people not to respond back with violence either. So make sure that you exemplify the godliness and virtue of our Lord Jesus Christ. And obviously, you can't do it on your own effort. You, you need the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to be walking um, in the Spirit. You need to be walking after the example of Jesus Christ. And, and just be thoughtful about everything that you're doing and the way you respond. Um, we don't want to be seen as just one side of, of a war. Um, rather, make sure that you understand that the war is spiritual in its nature and address it with spiritual weapons. Wow. Yeah, thank you for that. I, the realization and the truth is just simply that Christianity is in every way countercultural. Yeah. And so if the way we're responding is something that you could find at large in the culture, there's a good chance that it's probably not Christ-like. Yeah. Um, and so just, just a good litmus test, you know, 
Well, I hope that this has been helpful to you guys. Um, again, this is the fourth of this series. And then uh, after this, I think we'll probably get back to uh, some of the, the uh, theology that we've been going through. We'll pick that back up. It's been a while. Um, so, yeah, we have G3 conference coming up. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going to try to do uh, some special episodes. Then we'll see. It gets really busy. Um, yeah. Nikki's very popular. So you know, we'll see if I can pull him <laughs> away from from people but anyway he is popular in my book i, I like eggy a lot but uh anyway hope that this has been helpful for you guys well don't forget uh shoot us an email um if you'd like for us to cover a particular topic uh we'd love to hear your suggestions your thoughts um emails in the show notes don't forget to follow our youtube page um and again uh we we've got some big news coming out uh during the g3 conference i think that's going to be exciting for everyone, I think it'd be beneficial for the body of Christ over the next years here to come. So you don't want to miss that. So until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.